The Lee Box Join and Beehive Jig, model B975, makes it easy to route half inch and three quarter inch box joints in board widths up to 9 and 11 sixteenths of an inch and 13 sixteenths of an inch thick. Box joints are extremely strong and well suited for a variety of projects. From a simple box to a beehive. All box joint routing is done with the included Lee 160 half inch bit and the Lee E10 guide bushing. Four boards are prepared for making a box. All routing starts with the side stop in the socket board stop position. The first socket board is secured in place in a vise or portable workbench. Then the box joint and beehive jig is placed on top of the socket board, centered and clamped in place. The side stop is locked in place against the socket board and is now set for all socket and pin board routing. The socket board is routed by moving in and out of the template openings. This leaves a socket at each edge of the board. The jig is removed, the socket board is flipped, and the procedure is repeated to route the other end of the board as well as the second socket board. The pin board stop is flipped into position, providing the correct offset for the pin board relative to the socket board. The first pin board is secured in the vise and the jig is set in place with the pin board stop against the edge of the board. With the jig clamped in place, the pin board is routed. This leaves a pin at each edge of the board. The procedure is repeated on the other end of the pin board. Once completed, the second pin board is routed using the same techniques. With all four boards now routed, the box is assembled. Any joint fit adjustments are done with the E10 guide bushing. The outside barrel of the E-bush is elliptical in shape, unlike standard guide bushings which are round. Because of this, as the E-bush is turned within 90 degrees, the active diameter of the E-bush increases or decreases, resulting in a tighter or looser fit. Settings are recorded in the user guide for easy repeatability the next time you route box joints on the Lee Box Joint and Beehive Jig. The Craig Custom Pocket Hole Plug Cutter makes it possible to take Craig Joinery projects to the next level by giving you complete freedom to create your own custom plugs from any wood species. That means you can cut plugs from your own project stock to create plugs with color that matches your project better than has ever been possible before. Plus, the Custom Pocket Hole Plug Cutter allows you to create face grain plugs that blend in amazingly well. The plug cutter simply slips into a Craig jig in place of the normal drill guide block and works with a Craig Jig K5, K4, or even an older K3 model. That allows you to clamp your plug material in place and drill in the same way that is used for creating pocket holes. To create the plugs, just chuck the plug cutting bit into any drill. This high performance bit features a specially designed cutting tip that shears cleanly for a smooth, consistent plug. The bit also has an open design that presents wood from jamming inside the bit and fluting that reduces heat and friction for better plugs and longer bit life. A stop collar ensures perfect depth every time to produce accurately sized plugs. The custom pocket hole plug cutter comes with one bit that creates plugs for standard size Craig pocket holes. For even greater versatility, two optional bits are also available. One makes smaller diameter plugs that fit Craig micro pocket pocket holes. The other bit creates large plugs to work with the Craig Jig HD a plug size that's only possible using the custom pocket hole plug cutter. After cutting the custom made plugs free, they simply slip into the pocket holes. The plugs are sized to protrude only slightly above the surrounding surface. That means it's easy to sand or trim the plugs flush, producing a plug that virtually disappears. When you want the best matching pocket hole plugs possible, and when you want the freedom to create plugs from any type of wood, the Craig Custom Pocket Hole Plug Cutter is the solution you need. See how cleanly I extracted the subfloor with one saw, one blade, and no damage to the sheetrock, wires, or plumbing? One saw. What about this? 
Forget about pulling out your beam saw or making four cuts with two different saws. I could do it with one saw in two cuts. Bet your saw can't do this. How fast was that? And without the waste of material or ugly edges that can be created by a reciprocating saw. What if you could do this? I just cut that rim joist without marking or chalking any lines. Try that with any other saw. Could you even think about doing this with your circular saw? How many times would you have to pull out your tape measure just to cut these floor joists? 10, 20 times? Try doing it without measuring at all. And try doing this with your old circular saw. I used to have to do this by hand or switch to an undercut saw. Now I just rotate my handle 90 degrees for a perfect one pass undercuts in only a few seconds. Now, would you believe that you could do all these things and more with just one saw, all while significantly reducing construction costs? Believe it. Introducing the Straight Flush Saw, the 7-in-1 saw that's faster, safer, and more versatile than virtually any other comparable saw on the market. And it's about to change the construction industry forever. The Straight Flush Saw also comes with a heavy-duty lifetime guarantee. If one of the manufactured parts breaks or you experience a design flaw, just send it back to us and we'll send you a new straight flush even if you're not the original owner. Heard enough? Stop lugging around heavy, cumbersome saws that only have one function and start saving time, labor, and material costs today. Get the straight flush saw right now and experience the way a real saw is supposed to work. It's DeWalt's new compact circular saw. Redesigned to be one of the lightest circular saws in its class and job site tough. At only 8.8 .8 pounds, the new compact circular saw is light, designed for control on the job site and to help reduce user fatigue. It's also compact, completely redesigned with ergonomic handles and a built-in dust blower. Looking for performance? This saw has it. With a 15 amp motor, it provides plenty of power in a compact size and very smooth cutting performance, even through dense materials. The bevel mechanism allows for 57 degree bevel capacity and with a two and nine sixteenths inch depth of cut capacity, it will cut a two by material at 57 degrees in one pass. The anti-snag lower guard geometry allows for smooth operation at a wide variety of angles making it easy to use in advanced cutting applications. DeWalt tools are known for their durability. The compact circular saw features a new ball bearing lower guard, which provides long life even in dusty environments. The tough cord system provides 12 times better resistance against cord pull-out. This system strengthens the connection between the tool and cord for longer life and durability. This patented tool, called the ProSight Protractor from Sterrett, takes the guesswork out of cutting miter joints. Adjust the protractor arms so they're in contact with the wall. Read the miter saw angle directly from the tool. Set the saw to the same angle and cut. No calculations, no trial and error, just a perfect fit in a fraction of the time. The tool can be used for inside as well as outside corners and for a variety of profiles including crown and cornice molding. The protractor reading can also be used to set the miter saw for bevel cuts, such as those used for wider trim pieces like baseboard. The tool even comes in handy for determining end cut angles for flooring. Fit, read, set, and cut. Hello, I'm Eric from Bosch, and I'd like to give you a brief overview of the new GKF 12V eight cordless router. It's compatible with the 12 volt stroke 10.8 volt professional battery system. Um, it has a very quick and easy spindle lock feature which allows you to lock the spindle when changing bits. We also have a very fast adjustment of height here for getting your uh, course adjustment and a little wheel on the bottom for fine adjustment of the height. Very ergonomic, very light, has a brushless motor. You grab the machine like this and with this extended base here it gives great stability on the workpiece uh, while you're molding or trimming laminates uh, and other lighter jobs. So that's the GKF 12 V8 new 12 volt lithium ion professional router.
New for Father's Day, Ryobi introduces the 18-volt brushless drill driver and impact driver kit for only $149. Ryobi Brushless Motor Technology uses fewer wearable parts, extending the tool's life and giving you more speed, more torque, and more durability than traditional brushed motors. The brushless drill driver powers through tough applications with 460 inch-pounds of torque and features a new innovative dual-function half-inch chuck. Swap out bits faster than ever with the quarter-inch collet or secure them with the tried-and-true chuck jaws. The brushless impact driver has a variable speed trigger and delivers up to 2,000 inch-pounds of torque for control and power when driving long screws or large bolts. With more pro features including the MagTray magnetic holder, LED light, grip zone overmold and new innovative fastener-free belt clip, Ryobi continues to bring affordable innovation and performance to the job site. Work with confidence, knowing any OnePlus tool works with any OnePlus battery in a family. Introducing the Polygauge SS, a precision machined polygon with five angles commonly used by woodworkers. And its magnetic dual purpose knob and base connects the tool to steel machine tops, allowing for hands-free adjustments. Now you can set table saw blade angles perfectly the first time. Place the poly gauge SS horizontally to set miter fences easily. Or use with a miter saw to accurately set fence to blade angles. Quickly set up miter cuts with confidence and tackle complex projects you previously avoided with the poly gauge SS. Building something for your loved ones is one of the most rewarding experiences life has to offer. And it's never been more important to work safer and smarter at your craft. Microjig introduces Gripper 3D Push Block. And it's the safest, most precise push block giving you essential safety, precision and control when feeding work through a table saw. A must have for any table saw user. It gives you the three critical forces when cutting on the saw. Downward pressure to virtually eliminate kickback and keep the workpiece down on the tabletop. Inward pressure to keep the work against the fence and prevent wood burn. And forward pressure to advance the cut and control both sides of the workpiece. The gripper is engineered with a powerful gripping surface that gives you far greater control and traction. And the saw blade tunnel allows the table saw blade to pass through, keeping your hands shielded the entire cut and the adjustable center leg slides easily to accommodate a wide range of cutting dimensions and keeps a solid hold of the off-cut material. Using the gripper is simple and safe. Place the gripper on your workpiece, slide it against the fence, and guide the cut along the fence, and you'll get a safe cut. The gripper is a fully adjustable push block system engineered to handle the demands of your workshop and your full range of projects. And it's amazing when it comes to handling small workpieces. The built-in balance support drops down and stabilizes for narrow work material, keeping your gripper square to the fence. The workpiece gets full contact with the gripping surface to ensure a smooth, clean and safe cut. The precise quarter-inch leg makes the gripper the most precise pusher in the world. The proprietary green grip is lined across the length of the leg to make sure you have a firm grasp over the smallest pieces of wood, allowing you to cut down to a quarter inch by quarter inch. All the while your hands are protected. With the gripper, you have your own moving blade guard. The gripper is an extremely versatile piece of woodworking equipment. We've also introduced Gripper Advanced, comes with two additional precision accessories. 
The stabilizing plate gives you 250% more stabilizing area and locks the workpiece against the fence to enhance the versatility of the gripper. It intelligently maintains even pressure without binding to create safer and virtually burn-free cuts. The adjustable spacer adds one inch of additional gripping surface to tackle larger material and wider cuts. The Craig Jig R3 is the portable, affordable way to create strong, tight-fitting Craig joints so you can make home improvements, build bookcases and shelves, create storage projects, build furniture and more. Plus, the Craig Jig R3 is great for making lasting repairs. Simply position the jig on one of the pieces to be joined and then drill a pocket hole using the special Craig stepped drill bit. Drive in a Craig pocket hole screw and you're done. The self-tapping screw pulls the pieces tightly together for a joint that's strong and secure without unsightly fasteners or messy glue. The Craig Jig R3 works with materials from half inch to one and a half inch thick to build indoor and outdoor projects using everything from thin plywood to two by fours. Just adjust the positioning sliders on the jig to match the workpiece thickness. Then set the drill bit stop collar using the gauge built into the R3's carrying case. Clamp the R3 to the workpiece and it's ready to go to work. If you've ever installed drawer slides, you know it can be a challenge. You have to position the slide at exactly the right height with just the right setback and hold it perfectly level while you try to screw it to the cabinet. It's a fussy, frustrating job unless you have Rockler's new Universal Drawer Slide Jig. Designed to work with most of all bearing, epoxy, and center mount slides, the jig holds the slide securely and makes it easy for you to position it perfectly for quick, accurate installations. And it features an indexing rod that makes repeated installations a snap. Like all great jigs, it's easy to use. Just separate the two parts of the slide and put the cabinet track in the jig as it will be installed in the cabinet. An integral stop guarantees the right setback from the front of the cabinet, and the innovative locking wedge grips the slide securely, so you don't have to worry about it shifting or tipping. Beveled edges on the jig's wings line up with the bottom of the slide for easy positioning at the cabinet, and there's a scale in case you need to offset the mounting height. The jig positions the slide square to the front of the cabinet and level from front to back. Flat areas on the body make it easy to clamp it to the cabinet if you want to free up both hands to drive the mounting screws. After installing a couple of screws, you can release the locking wedge, remove the jig, and drive all the remaining mounting screws, as directed in the slide instructions. If you need to install multiple slides at the same height, this jig will save you a lot of time and the hassle of measuring at each location. It features an indexing rod that lets you register the slide off of a reference surface on the cabinet. The rod can be installed from the top or bottom of the jig, depending on the location of the reference surface. The Rockler Bench Cookie, the new non-slip bench pad that lifts, grips, and protects your work. Bench cookies work well around sawdust, and even hold a workpiece securely while belt sanding with a 60 grit belt. They raise the workpiece one inch above the work surface to provide clearance for bearings on a router bit, while at the same time hold it secure so you can route the edge without clamps. Bench cookies are the perfect way to provide clearance for staining and finishing an edge, and the rubber surface protects your workpiece from damage when sanding, finishing, or during assembly. Remember when you had to smooth out those joists? When you needed to easily fix a stubborn door or make two uneven boards flush? Now you can do all this and more with the Win Electric Hand Planer. The 6 amp motor provides up to 34,000 cuts per minute through even the hardest of woods. While most of our competitors have a maximum depth of 5 64ths of an inch, the wind planer exhibits 16 positive stops in 1 128th inch increments to fine-tune your cuts anywhere up to an eighth of an inch deep. 
The Win Electric Hand Planer also comes with a handy dust collection bag that can be attached to either the right or left hand side of the planer, an adjustment wrench with onboard storage, a kickstand to protect your blade, a rabbiting guide to help measure the depth of your rabbits, and a parallel fix for making perfectly straight cuts. The base of the plate even has a V-shaped groove to help make chamfering the corners of your wood easier than ever. And if you have a dust extractor, you can plug it right into either side of your unit to maximize the collection of sawdust and keep your work area clean. Remember when you had a reliable planer that gave you years of quality service? Remember when. Introducing the Compact Laser Measuring Tool. Now there's no need to measure twice. Just push a button once and cut once. With the ability to measure up to 100 feet and accuracy within an eighth of an inch, it'll take the headache out of any project. It's simple. Just point, press, and it does the work for you. With an ultra-thin design, it fits right into your pocket. Plus, it's so lightweight you'll forget it's even there. It can be used up to 2,000 times on a single charge. And with the included USB cable, it can be recharged from pretty much anywhere. An outlet, a car, or even a computer. Use it to build those shelves in your closet. Or to find the square footage of a wall in seconds. Whatever your project is, the compact laser measuring tool can handle it. Introducing the Portimate PM8000 PortiCube STR, the revolutionary portable workstation and storage center, designed to get the most out of your miter saw. Does it feel like every time you start a project, you struggle to find space in your crowded workshop? The Portimate PortiCube STR is your solution to a crowded workspace. The PortiCube STR's compact footprint is uniquely designed for portable storage of your miter saw. And when fully expanded, it will provide up to seven feet of working surface. Using the universal tool mounts, almost any size miter saw can be attached to the PortiCube STR's unique rotating base. Heavy duty 10 inch wheels and a retractable locking handle makes moving simple and easy. When you're ready to get to work, your miter saw easily rotates from its stored position and locks securely in place. Side extension wings and adjustable tool tables raise and lock into position. And adjustable feet can be used for leveling on uneven surfaces. With the PortiCube STR fully expanded, you are ready to start making cuts with your miter saw. When cutting is complete, rotate your saw back into storage and the PortiCube STR transforms into a seven foot work surface, perfect for working on additional projects you may have. When your work is finished, simply return the PortiCube STR to its compact size, raise the retractable handle and easily roll it back into storage, ready for your next project. I 
doing this, we can perfectly match the dust extractor to the specific power tool. We think in systems. Customers will be satisfied if the machine performs flawlessly in several areas of the work environment. Craftsmen can breathe in toxins from their work environment. With a Festool system, these hazardous particles are immediately captured and contained. The inner workings of the tool are protected during use from the dusty environment. This system allows our tools to last much, much longer. If dust is not removed during the sanding process, the dust simply remains on the surface. With extraction, the dust is removed immediately and therefore cannot settle on the abrasive. This, in turn, ensures excellent sanding, time and again. Users need considerably less abrasive. At the end of the day, this saves both time and money. Our products are easy to learn and use. Becoming comfortable with a Festool is straightforward. We strive to make sure our customers understand the products. The customer needs to know what that button is for, even though he has never pressed it. The design is then really all about getting the message across about this intuitive operation. The extractors vary in size, providing a variety of options. Most of our units are full HEPA certified. It's clear to see that our system approach centers around working clean and efficient, covering any job, large or small. Our design language is characterized by becoming uncompromisingly functional, clear, very simple, easily recognizable, and radiating a seriousness of durability that lives up to the quality of our machines. A power tool that automatically activates the dust extractor when switched on. If you have a Festool power tool, the Festool extractor hose will be a perfect fit.
first step to uh, installing cabinets uh, is uh, obviously is to unpack your tools. So the installers get started with a little showmanship and uh, bring all the uh, necessary uh, equipment they're going to need to install uh, install the kitchen. Um, a couple of bags full of uh, cordless tools, a chop saw, an air compressor, uh, a portable table saw, a ladder, uh, some various hand tools. Um, that they'll use uh, to install the kitchen. Once the tools are unpacked and uh, the cords are all run, the air lines are all run, um, and they got a pretty good game plan, this kitchen is already unboxed. The cabinets have already been unboxed and inspected. Um, they lay out the wall cabinets up against the wall uh, per the plan uh, in the general area where they're going to go. Next the installer is going to measure more precisely exactly which cabinets are going where and he starts with the wall cabinets. Uh, if this was an L-shaped kitchen he would start in the corner and work his way out but because this is just uh, one, one wall is covered with wall cabinets uh, he can just go right across, start from one end to the other. Uh, the refrigerator line in this house uh, comes off of an interior wall uh, and a pantry cabinet is in the corner. Uh, in the state of Georgia, the fridge line cannot be on the exterior wall, which is that back wall um, where the wall cabinets are actually being hung, so uh, that's why it comes off the side. The base of the uh, utility cabinet or pantry cabinet is then cut around the 2x4 and uh, the water line that will go to the refrigerator uh, a hole is drilled and the, uh, the base is set. Next, uh, both installers will kind of manhandle the pantry cabinet. One installer can do this but because there's two on this job it just makes sense uh, for two to do it where one holds it up uh, and the other installer kind of guides that, uh, that refrigerator water line or ice maker line um, through the hole that was drilled in the bottom of the utility cabinet. Um, in the winter time, these these pipes can be brittle, so it has you have to be careful and uh, just slide that that utility cabinet right onto the base. The next step is to just simply screw the um, utility cabinet to the base. Uh, one thing the installer could have done in this case is he can level the, the base or the toe kick uh, before putting this cabinet on top of it uh, and then he wouldn't have to level it afterwards but here he just chose to set it on the floor and then he'll use some cedar shims and then just level the entire assembly before he screws it to the wall. So here he's just uh, using the shims and his little pry bar and he just looks up at his torpedo level that's up on the top of the uh, cabinet and he just levels the cabinet. He'll check it uh, from side to side and then also from front to back before he actually screws it to the wall. The next step is uh, all the wall cabinets that uh, go down the line on this wall. Um, he's going to drill some pilot holes and set some screws inside those holes. Um, as he's got all the wall cabinets kind of set in place uh, on the run, so he'll just go ahead and, and drill all the pilot holes. Um, the face frame to face frame assembly, this helps to keep uh, the wood from splitting, and uh, he'll just go ahead and drill all those holes. The next step before he uh, starts to bring up that other cabinet that attaches to the utility cabinet is he wants to draw a nice level uh, line which would be the top of the cabinet and he wants to find where the studs are. Um, he, here he's measuring the length of that cabinet and now he'll just use his hammer and uh, pound and find the studs marking the wall so that he can see it after the cabinet is uh, hung he can see where the studs are. Now 
now it's just a matter of positioning his ladder and having his screw gun available and uh, getting ready so that he can lift up this cabinet and go up the ladder and he's in proper position to go ahead and uh, screw that cabinet to both the wall and to the utility cabinet uh, to his right. Um, and th this is what's key into putting screws in holes and dr drilling pilot holes. Uh, he's holding it up with his, uh, the, his uh, left thigh, holding it in place, and uh, he's using that line that he already drawn and using a level to ensure that he's leveling it um, and screwing it to the studs that he's already marked uh, where he knows every, where all the studs are. The next cabinet that he's going to hang in the line is just a standard wall cabinet. Um, he uses his, uh, his handy helper there. It's just a 2x2 two two, uh, cut into a T. Um, the cabinets are 54 inches off the floor, uh, 54 and a half if he had to account for uh, any kind of hardwood floor. Uh, and then he just simply screws it together and also screws it to the wall. Uh, the T, T uh, helping hands uh, is, is uh, some installers will put a piece of carpet on the top of that T, um, but all it does is holds it. It helps them to hold it in place, um, you know, gravity and the weight of the cabinet, and uh, it really helps the installer just uh, get that cabinet on the wall. Again, you can see the level at the top of the cabinet. Um, he's ensuring that as he goes down the run, um, that he's nice and level. Um, it's important that all the uh, all cabinets are level. The next cabinet in this line. Um, is the cabinet that goes above the range. Um, there'll be a microwave slash hood uh, uh, exhaust fan that will be uh, attached to the bottom of this cabinet. So he needs to cut out for that electrical outlet and also for that pipe. So what he's doing is measuring from the side of the cabinet that he's already installed. He, and the line that he drew at the top, which is level, he marks on there and he's looking for a stud. And uh, he marks the dimensions and uh, he will just transfer that onto the cabinet on the floor as he cuts the holes. Uh, having trouble finding some studs there, aren't you, Armando? Hmm. There's at least one we know of because that outlet is always attached to one. Yeah, just one. I don't know. Putting a hole in the drywall and reaching your fingers in there to ensure where the studs are, is, uh, you won't see that because the cabinets will cover that, but that's, that's a technique that's perfectly acceptable. Here he's transferring the electrical outlet uh, drawing uh, nice straight lines with his torpedo level um, and he'll cut that out. He's already transferred. He's looked up at the wall. He's transferring the information that he already measured. Uh, also you can see the slash marks where he did find the stud and uh, he's just going to cut out these uh, the holes uh, for both these uh, the outlet and the pipe, the exhaust pipe. I'm just going to freehand that circle. doesn't have to be perfect. Um, the, uh, the heating and air guy that hooks up that uh, exhaust fan, uh, he'll use a, a special kind of tape that really just covers up all that, it seals it. Uh, here he just uses a, a skill saw to do the plunge, uh, a plunge cut. Uh, if, you, if you do that right, you don't even, on the inside of the cabinet, you won't even see the saw blade marks. Uh, here he's just using a portable jigsaw, he dr drilled a pilot hole first and he's using a portable jigsaw to just uh, cut out that hole that he uh, hand drew uh, into the position of the back of that cabinet.
Uh, here he had to put a piece of, uh, he's used toe kick, uh, where the panel would also work. Because the cabinet is bumped out or forward, um, he needs to fill the void from the sides of the cabinet of the face frame and, that, uh, and the sides. So uh, here he's lifting the cabinet up into position. Again, he's already, he's found the studs. Uh, it kind of holds up anyways from the pipe. Um, the, the, the holes are already pre-drilled um, and he's just uh, holding it up with his thigh and his body and uh, screwing the cabinet uh, to the adjacent cabinet. Once again checking for level right. and he'll screw into the back of the cabinet into the studs. He transfers the numbers correctly uh, and takes his time he can easily line up the uh, receptacle and the vent pipe. Here he's just locating the stud on the bottom of the cabinet and uh, what he does is he pounds on the wall once he finds it and he just uses the rubber end of the handle to scuff the wall um, where he can see after the cabinet's in position where to put the screw in the inside of the cabinet. Again on that one uh, cabinet that's bumped forward uh, the toe kick or even a panel can be used uh, to fill the void from the face frame to the side of the cabinet. Again he's using his uh, handy helper uh, T-stick and uh, he's got his tools positioned and he's just going to level that cabinet. Here he's checking, very important to make sure that it's exactly 30 inches. Um, that's what the vent uh, the microwave uh, uh, vent fan uh, will be installed underneath that cabinet and it's got to be exactly 30 inches. The wall cabinets are already hung. Uh, they're done and he can move on to the base cabinets. Uh, the first step uh, for the base cabinets is to clean any of the drywall mud or clumps of anything that's on the floor. Um, he wants a nice flat surface uh, to work with, so he's using his quickie square, it's an aluminum quickie square, kind of scraping the floor, uh, and then he'll broom sweep it uh, to remove all the debris. That's the 220 line where the gas range is going and the gas a gas line uh, next to it. He's just going to tie that off, just get keep that out of his way and uh, continue to clean the floor. Uh, just like he uh, shimmed up that utility cabinet um, earlier, he'll have to do that with the base cabinets as well. So he wants a nice clean, clean area, flat surface to do all that. Here he's carefully marking, this is going to get a Lazy Susan uh, cabinet, it's 36 inches from the corner of the wall. Um, it's a cylinder type cabinet, uh, really doesn't have any sides to it. So it's important that he locates that cabinet and he starts his, uh, just like he would if uh, the wall cabinets were in an L configuration, he always starts in the corner and works his way out um, with his dimensions. He'll mount the sink base cabinet first but uh, he always starts in the corner. Here the line is exactly lined up to the top of the wall cabinet um, where that range space is going. Here he's just using the drawer base that's going to the end of the run. He needs a cabinet with the side of the wall so that he can transfer all the information from the plumbing pipes in the sink base over to the bottom of the sink base cabinet. So that, that cabinet that's over there now is not the cabinet that's actually going in there, but he's just using it to, uh, so he has his tape measure, he can he can actually uh, butt it up against right where he marked on the wall uh, where that cylinder or Lazy Susan cabinet will be. And here he's just transferring all the, all the dimensions. Uh, he could have brought that sink base a little closer to him if he wanted to. He wouldn't have to walk as far, but uh, he's a professional and he's getting it done. An important step here is he's just going to use the uh, pilot hole to his paddle bit and he's going to drill through and locate so he can spin the cabinet around. If he was to drill that all the way through, he would tear out uh, the inside of the cabinet. So he just wants to know where those holes are, flip it around, then use his paddle bit for the two water lines. Um, he's even scoring the, uh, the uh, drain pipe 
where he's going to use his hole saw um, just so it doesn't tear the, the paper on that uh, particle board. And that's going to line up perfectly if he transferred his uh, dimensions properly. The hole saw is a two and a quarter inch, uh, the pipe is two inch, and uh, the uh, three quarter inch water line uses a one inch paddle bill. Here he's locating the back of the cabinet where that uh, wire is going to go through. That is for a garbage disposal. Again, he'll, dr he'll drill with the pilot hole and then return back to the face of the cabinet not to tear out any of that paper. And he drills the hole. And now he's ready to, uh, to mount that cabinet. Before he does, he decides he's going to drill, just as he did with the, uh, the wall cabinets, he's drilling a pilot hole and all the face frame to face frame assembly. So that's going to reduce splitting and uh, the uh, self-tapping screws that screw the face frames together, the hardwood, um, he just wants to make sure that those go in smoothly and doesn't crack. Here he's uh, pulling, pulling the wire that will be used for the garbage disposal and then just uh, dropping the cabinet in on top of those lines. Again, he wants to make sure that the, you know, he's, he's kind of holding it up with his knees right now and then locating it. In the winter time, you do have to be careful that uh, polybutylene plumbing, uh, those water lines do have pressure in it. Um, you don't want to split the water line. Uh, water would go all over, so he's just being careful to put that in there. And he transferred his dimensions correctly, and he's lined up, no problem and he just has to slide uh, the sink base to the center of that window is where he wants to locate it. So the center of the cabinet is located at the center of the window. Here he's bringing in that Lazy Susan cabinet. Um, he's removed the uh, drawer base that he just used to locate it and now he'll just screw that Lazy Susan cabinet to the sink base. Again there's no sides to uh, the cylinder type Lazy Susan cabinet so um, there's a couple of different steps to get this thing, uh, get this thing right where you want it, get that sink base where you want it. Had that just been a square cabinet or uh, a cabinet that had walls, some other kind of corner cabinet, he wouldn't have had to use that other uh, drawer base. He could just simply start in the corner with that cabinet and work his way, work his way out. He makes sure that the front, the face frames are nice and flush when he screws it in. He does it quickly, but it shouldn't be uh, taken lightly. He's being very careful because uh, that's one of the things that the field rep will be inspecting is to make sure that the face frames are nice and flush. Uh, so that cabinet's located uh, uh, perfectly, and uh, he also checked with the level to make sure it's nice and straight. And now he'll cut that that side panel, and you can see the face frame and the line. Uh, is nice and straight. Here he's just checking for level uh, and he's also checking to make sure that the front of that is perfectly straight and that's what you want. Uh, you don't want it to wavy in and out. You don't want it to follow the contour of the wall if it's not straight. Um, you just you want that to be nice and straight. Here he's putting a cleat or a sacrificial piece of material so he has something to nail that uh, side panel to uh, and he's just screwing that to the wall. Uh, it's not holding up the house. Uh, he doesn't have to worry if it's not hitting a stud. Um, so he just needs something that's just going to stop that uh, side panel from flopping in. Here he's checking the dishwasher space, moving that drawer base that he used earlier. That, that goes to the end of the run. And it's 24 and a quarter inches is the standard uh, dishwasher space. And he'll mount, that, uh, he'll mount that drawer base to the wall. Here he's cutting the panel, and while he's at it, and he's at the saw, he's going to cut. There's a piece that we uh, put at the top of the dishwasher. We rip down a filler that's three-quarter of an inch thick down to half inch thick, and we attach that in the top of the dishwasher space. This home will be getting granite. So the dishwasher, uh, the uh, person that has to put in the dishwasher, has something to screw the dishwasher to. Um, if we didn't do this step, uh, that person would have to actually screw the dishwasher, the top, uh, into granite, and that just looks very difficult. So here he's uh, got the side panel. He uses his quickie square uh, to cut out the toe kick. Um, it's going to go right here on the side. Um, you can see the toe kick is kind of notched out. Um, it's a four-inch toe kick. So he uses his uh, cordless circular saw and just makes that cut.
Now it's just a matter of putting the panel that he ripped down to size and cut the toe cook out into place and just uses his nailer and uh, nails it in place. The next step uh, here is uh, that cabinet uh, by design is not designed to hold up a piece of granite or any countertop so a wall cleat is required. Um, he'll just use his level and uh, locate a level mark and he'll use any sacrificial piece of material, a 2x4 that he finds, a scrap piece of uh, filler and he's just going to attach that to the wall underneath that line and that way the countertop will actually rest on that and not on the top of that drum. Um, uh, the, the cabinet really isn't designed to hold any weight and also you don't want the countertop to droop in the corner. Uh, this is an important step. Next step is just to locate where that uh, base uh, to the right of the range uh, is located. Um, it should essentially line up to the cabinet above it, but uh, it's more important that from face frame to face frame, the dimension is minimum 30 inches, maximum 30 and 3 eighths. We generally do about uh, 3 and a quarter inches uh, as standard. Uh, most ranges are about 29 and 7 eighths wide, so it gives plenty of room. Um, he's checking for level, both front and back, side to side. He's also checking to make sure if you notice the level all the way across uh, from the corner cabinet. Uh, the next step is he needs to locate where that island goes. Uh, most of the installers uh, have smartphones. The plan is on their phone. Um, so he's just looking to see what the dimension was for. He did this uh, uh, for the island. He did this earlier to find out uh, where all the cabinets go. But uh, now he's just uh, checking from the side, from the sink side wall, uh, where does that island get located, and then from the range wall. Those two dimensions are key for him to know where exactly to line up that island. And it's, more, it's important, too, not just to measure from one corner to another. He's got to make sure, as you'll see, he'll walk over and make sure it's parallel uh, with that back wall as well. So. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes and uh, you can find the right location. Then he draws a, a, a pencil line um, all the way around the perimeter of the, uh, of the cabinet. And here he's just curious, uh, he wants to make sure was it uh, facing the proper way, is it orientated properly. Even though he's got the correct dimensions, do the drawers go out or do the drawers go in? Uh, here he's going to go ahead and put the toe kick on. Uh, before he mounts it and he stapled that on and he just uses two by fours in his nailer as concrete nailer uh, which is uh, just drives a concrete nail into that uh, two by four he could make that two by four as long as it needed to be where the island wouldn't go back and it wouldn't slide or adjust um, that's that's a step that uh, uh, that he could have done, but uh, might be that he just found a scrap piece of two by four out in the garbage that was wasn't long enough. So he's just going to shoot that, and he backs off the line that he drew, the thickness of the side of the cabinet, because the cabinet has to actually fall right on top or uh, within inside uh, the two by four. He also marks the floor so he can see how long the two by four is after he puts the. Uh, puts the cabinet in place, drills a pilot hole like he did before, uh, you know, starts it from the bottom, finishes it from the top so he doesn't have tear out, and then just drops the island into place. Um, the islands will be screwed down uh, to that 2x4, and it, because he marked the floor he can see where exactly where the 2x4 is, and he's just going to nudge it into place. One last check to make sure he's got it correct. The hardwood floor will go in afterwards, uh, so that'll kind of get sandwiched in there. So you want to make sure that island's in the right place. 
Uh, same rules apply with any base cabinet. Um, you got to shim it. You got to make sure it's nice and level, and it looks good. The concrete was pretty good in this house. Uh, the screw will go nice and low to the ground so that the quarter round will cover the screw. He wants to also make sure that it's flush. He'll drive that right in. He's already screwed in this other side. And you can see the two screws, four screws total, and between the marks, and that island won't move. Uh, now he's paneling the back. Um, he has to cut that panel to fit. Um, he wants a nice, tight, uh, nice, clean fit. That raw wood that you see on the edge of that panel is going to be covered by, by some outside corner mold. But uh, the, here he just wants to make sure that he staples it uh, probably every four to six inches all the way around the perimeter just so it doesn't bow or heat. If he put some glue on there, some uh, liquid nails, he wouldn't have to worry about that, but uh, rarely do they do that. So. Um, so he'll just make sure he staples it all the way around the perimeter. The other installer is now done with the uh, baths in uh, this house. He was installing uh, the hall bath and the master bath, so now he's back and he will start working on uh, drilling for holes and uh, maybe some toe kick while this installer finishes up a little bit of the trim. While that's happening, this installer is working on uh, drilling for knobs. Um, the, the ins most installers don't need to measure uh, the center uh, to locate where the knob goes. They can go ahead and just use their tape measure for distance. You can kind of eyeball where it goes in the center. And this knob, this particular knob, you have plenty of play. The base of it is so wide that if you had to make an adjustment, if you drilled it a little off, it wouldn't be a problem uh, finding the center. Uh, the drawer. Uh, drawer, drawer fronts actually you need to measure uh, both directions. Uh, you need to measure uh, from side to side and up and down. You could eyeball it, but uh, that's kind of risky. Installers don't want to have to pay for, pay for new drawer fronts if they uh, misdrill. It's important to use a nice uh, uh, sharp bit and to let the drill do the cutting um, so you don't get any blowout out the back of the doors and drawers. Here he's just opening up all the packages of knobs um, and separating the screws and then he'll go ahead with all the holes already drilled, he'll go ahead and put all the screws in and just walk around the kitchen put all the screws in first. And then with a handful of uh, knobs in one hand, his screwdriver, or a uh, uh, cordless screwdriver in the other, the screws are already in the hole, he can walk around and uh, just simply screw all the knobs on. It's a pretty quick process. The next step is trim. Uh, one installer will start with some toe kick. We already did the island. Uh, the other installer will start with some scribe. Uh, with face mount crown, it's always best to do the scribe first, uh, and you'll see in a minute. Um, but the scribe just covers that gap between the cabinet and the wall if the uh, cabinets had to be shimmed away from the wall. Um, it's also decorative. It kind of finishes it off rather than just a bead of caulk. It's important to get the scribe nice and flush to the cabinet and uh, you know shoot as minimal of holes as possible because every hole you shoot you have to fill with putty later. Here he's putting the scribe on the face of the cabinet, uh, that utility cabinet up against the wall. And the kitchen is really coming along. The scribe molding on the face um, is recessed down just a little bit on where that face mount crown will be and uh, here is just the path of the uh, crown molding that he will nail to the face of that cabinet. Um, the sides of this utility cabinet, there's a sacrificial piece that needs to be put in to, uh, 
to uh, take up that gap um, but you can see there and he'll follow the bottom edge of that crown right on that and there you can see the little shelf for that that scribe molding where the top of that crown will hit or the bottom of that crown will hit here he can go ahead uh, face mount crown has to be cut upside down uh, the reason for this is then he can just measure he doesn't have to keep going back he can just measure the lengths of all the cabinets because the bottom of the crown will be for example a 30 inch cabinet the bottom of the crown will be 30 inches um, so he can go ahead and cut if he cuts it upside down he can go ahead and cut a lot of the pieces without even having to uh, go measure um, the wall cabinets that are already up if this was full overlay crown which sits on top of uh, the cabinets um, there's some calculating that has to be done and most installers will cut that uh, face up so uh, that's just a different process uh, than this particular crown but he can go ahead and cut all those pieces uh, without even looking at the uh, looking at the assembly here he's just cutting that little return because that one cabinet bumps out it's over the range um, those pieces you'll see in a minute uh, when he installs it it uh, just kind of bumps towards you So he gathers up his pieces, uh, gets his ladder and his nail gun, and he, he this particular installer likes to start in the middle and work his way to both the left and the right. Um, I personally, I start at the end and work my way to the other end, but this just, uh, there's no right way or wrong way. Um, it's just a, just a personal preference. Most installers do not need to uh, use their torpedo level or uh, to tell uh, where to install this. You're just making sure that the reveal is uh, exactly the same um, on both sides of the cabinet. Uh, it's, it's more of an eyeball thing. Uh, the straighter and more level it is, obviously, the easier it is. The saw only knows to cut things square as long as you have it up against the fence and the, uh, the base of the cabinet square. So uh, the joints will be nice and tight as long as you, uh, as long as you install it nice and square. This piece looks like it's just a sliver too long, so the installer will take it back to the uh, back to the chop saw and take off about a half a blade. Crown molding takes time. Um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh, it's just more of the finesse part of the install. Now he's got a nice perfect fit. See how that scribe kind of holds up the bottom of that crown for him? Um, it's like a little shelf or helping hands. And then he just uh, he just shoots it all in place with some brad nails. Uh, you're not trying to hold up the house. Uh, it's decorative, so you just want to use a, a, a small nail, a small brad nail, put in a, a small hole. Um, remember, every time you shoot a hole, it's got to be filled, so uh, don't go crazy with that nail gun. Again, that face mount crown is upside down. He can just uh, mark his dimensions for the cabinets that are to the right of that range cabinet that he's already installed all the crown to the left of. And it's just a matter of taking your time, having a sharp uh, saw blade. You can see the guard has slits in it. So that's so he can see the pencil mark. And uh, he just goes ahead and makes all his cuts. One technique uh, that's good to do uh, once you cut this kind of finished product is to color the ends just a little bit uh, with a uh, marker that's the color of the cabinets and then when you put those joints together uh, you don't need as much putty. Um, he didn't do that over at the other uh, joint that he already put together but I asked him to do it in this, in this case just so I could uh, show show that technique which is pretty good this is maple crown so it's very white or blonde in color 
Here he's on that utility cabinet. Again, he's just uh, attaching that face mount. I asked him to you put the torpedo level up there just so for people that uh, don't can't eyeball it. And that's how you would do it. You just use your torpedo level, put it at the top of that crown, and uh, you can ensure that you're nice and straight. Um, it's really unnecessary if you do this a lot uh, because you can eyeball it. Again, some pieces need to be trimmed, so he'll just go back to the saw and trim it. Um, this is that longer piece. He's trying to get a nice tight fit. Uh, anytime, this is one of the problems with uh, working your way from the center out. If you keep, if you go from left to right or right to left, you don't have this. You don't have this issue. Now he's 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 kind of put himself in a pinch where he's trying to get two angled cuts to fit properly. Uh, the other installer is working on that toe kick, which is just pieces of flat board that will cover the bottom of the cabinets and uh, he'll staple it as low as possible looks like he's putting in a lot of nails and as high as possible uh, he does that pretty quick but uh, those nails won't have to be filled here he's just using his putty and his uh, his rag and he's filling all the nail holes that on the outside corner mold um, he's also coloring the ends of the uh, toe kick because it's raw material he wants that to match and he'll just wipe off the excess with his rag. Armando's still working on that crown. If he would have worked from left to right, it wouldn't have been as hard, but uh, he's got himself in a pinch. And after that's done, uh, Carlos will go ahead and he's starting to fill some nail holes. Uh, the other installer, Armando, is going ahead and putting the uh, shelves in. All the shelf clips had to be put in as well. Um, that's another step. And he's just touching up anything he sees. Uh, he, he just touched a little bit uh, of the back of the where the knob was drilled. Um, you might get a little blowout, so he used his uh, little bit of putty and touched the back of that knob just to fill that, that screw hole. It's an important step. Um, it's tedious, but uh, it's important to fill all the nail holes, uh, to check to make sure that uh, it looks good, that the joints are tight, and to place all the shelves in the cabinets. Shelves are adjustable in these in this cabinet. Uh, rarely do people actually move their shelves. Um, they'll probably be there uh, for the duration that someone's in this home. And the utility shelf goes in as well. That's also adjustable. Next step is just uh, leveling all the doors uh, and making sure the drawers are working properly. Uh, here he's just unscrewing the. Uh, the hinge just a little bit and then screwing it back in to drop it down. He uses a torpedo level just to make sure it's nice and straight and uh, you can adjust them by just giving it a little tap um, if you didn't horse it down and screw it. It's nice and straight and it opens properly. And that is pretty much it. Uh, now the installers have the tedious task of uh, picking up all their uh, tools and repacking and uh, taking care of the trash. This install, uh, from start to finish, uh, even with me videotaping, um, took approximately these two experienced installers um, about four and a half hours. Um, that was already unboxed and inspected because this is their actual second install for the day. Um, that probably took uh, anywhere from uh, 30 to 40 minutes. So probably from start to finish, uh, from tools, from curb to curb, uh, it's about five hours for these two guys.
And here you can see the finished product. All the knobs are in place. Uh, it's been cleaned. Uh, everything's level and square and true. Uh, cabinets on the inside have been cleaned out. Uh, plenty of screws, wall cleats. We watch that. Uh, doors and drawers have been adjusted. All the nail holes are filled. Um, these are kind of the things that the field rep will be looking for uh, when he does his quality inspection. And it's a good install. This is uh, 100% complete. Uh, there was no damaged cabinets and uh, everything went in well per plan. And uh, it looks good. And that concludes this uh, kitchen install video. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, please do so in the comment section. And thanks for watching.
Vamos estar tá vendo agora a instalação e configuração da fechadura YMF de 40 e a temos aqui o manual o gabarito de instalação para fazer a furação na porta essa parte aqui é indicado contratar o marceneiro para fazer essa, essa parte de furação da porta e aqui é a fechadura temos aqui a frontal a parte de trás telha chave parafusos contra a chapa da, do batente e aqui a máquina de embutir dentro da porta vamos ver como que a gente instala ela configura também Vamos lá então. Temos aqui a máquina. A fechadura que vai dentro da porta. Vamos estar tá fazendo a inversão do, do trinco, né? Faz aqui nossa. Essa pequena porta vai estar vai tá fechando nessa posição. Então vamos ter que mudar o lado do trinco. Pode, podemos observar que a furação está feita aqui na minha mini porta. Eu até deixei o gabarito colado aqui. Para vocês poderem dar uma olhada melhor. Então vamos virar o lado do nosso trinco para poder fechar de acordo. É simples de fazer esse procedimento. A gente remove os três parafusos da, contra, da chapa testa aqui da fechadura. Não é difícil de fazer. Tiramos os lados aqui, tiramos, tiramos a chapa testa, viramos o lado do nosso trinco, o lado correto, colocamos a chapa testa de volta e recolocamos os parafusos. Colocamos os três parafusos.
conectamos os parafusos, agora outra coisa importante que devemos sempre ficar, prestar atenção para não deixar errado é os parafusos antipânico. Esses dois parafusos aqui, que está no cubo aqui, esses dois parafusos, eles sempre tem que estar do lado de dentro de casa, por exemplo, nunca Nunca pro lado de fora, do lado de fora da casa, sempre do lado de dentro. Então, caso eles estivessem desse lado aqui, a gente teria que tirar um por vez e colocar desse lado aqui. Por exemplo, tiraria o primeiro daqui, colocaria aqui. Aí depois iria, tiraria o segundo e colocaria aqui. Mas no nosso caso, eles já estão na posição correta, vão ficar do lado de dentro, que é a função antipânico sempre os parafusos do lado de dentro. Agora vamos colocar o corte. E colocar os parafusos. Podemos observar o saquinho dos parafusos. Vem os dois parafusos que vai na fechadura e os três menor que vai na nossa contra-chapa no caso já está aqui no local Isso. Vamos agora instalar a parte da frente, a frontal da fechadura. Vamos selecionar o lado da maçaneta. girar para o lado correto caso você gire para o lado errado é só você vir aqui pressionar essa travinha para baixo que ela destrava a maceta fica boba novamente para você escolher o lado que você que for correto né caso o nosso lado é aqui é esse daqui Correto. Com a lingueta recolhida, você vai colocar a haste do cilindro na horizontal, nessa posição aqui. Ó. Se você tentar colocar de outro jeito, não dá, ou é de, só ela só é possível ficar na horizontal. Na vertical você não pode pôr, porque ela não vai encaixar aqui é, no cubo da lingueta, porque ele está na horizontal também, com a lingueta recolhida. Aí você tem que deixar ele na horizontal também, ó, retinho. Ó. Não, não é na vertical, não é na vertical, nem para um lado nem para o outro, é na horizontal. Vai procurar o lado da horizontal e vai colocar ele. Não é. Falei errado. <risos> é... Você vai colocar ele na vertical. Nessa posição. Certo? Acho em pé. Na vertical. Na vertical. 
você pode dar, você pode até observar aqui comigo que o cubo ele está numa posição na vertical também, a posição para receber a haste do cilindro. Então agora é só a gente fazer esse procedimento. Vamos passar o cabo da fechadura, ó, a parte superior, vamos passar o cabo. Aí pegamos o eixo e encaixamos. Perfeito. Podemos observar aqui, ó. Certinho. Encaixe. Agora vamos para o próximo passo. Que é colocar colocar o espaçador para começarmos a fixação o espaçador de borracha e a parte metálica para fixação está na parte traseira a gente vai tirar tirar a parte colocar no devido lugar. Vamos lá. Com cuidado a gente passa o carro branco. Conexão. Passa o cabo da fechadura. Posiciona. A gente vem com a parte metálica Vamos passar o cabo também então vamos lá esse cabo escuro aqui o clipe ele vai aqui por baixo eu observei aqui na no espaçador que ele tem um local de passar certinho então, passamos ele por aqui ó é isso aí E agora vamos pôr a parte metálica de fixação, que vai aqui por cima. Vamos lá. Tem o local de passar o cabo da fechadura também. agora corretamente após posicionar posicionar corretamente né vamos pegar os nossos parafusos de fixações que no começo vem dentro da caixa e vamos Ele vai prender essa parte aqui. São seis, um, dois, três, quatro, cinco, seis. A gente deixar
gente todos devidamente fixados. Podemos observar aqui a nossa frontal. Beleza. Cabo lenho danificado, tudo perfeito. Vamos para o próximo passo. Que é colocar a parte de trás. Mesmo, mesmo procedimento, posicionar a maçaneta do lado correto. Caso errou, tem a trava aqui também de apertar para ela liberar. Vamos colocar do nosso lado correto. Detalhe interessante que eu acabei esquecendo. No nosso kit de parafusos vem uma chapinha. Que é uma cobertura para pôr aqui no fio. Ela vai ficar desse jeito aqui. Então a gente remove esses dois parafusos e coloca ela e prende por cima do parafuso. Por baixo do parafuso é... Vou mostrar para vocês. Removemos o parafuso, vamos pôr a nossa proteção aqui no fio e colocamos os parafusos de volta. Colocamos a nossa proteção, no kit de parafuso vem esses três ferrinhos aqui ó, são três medidas diferentes, que aqui você vai usar de acordo com a espessura da sua porta. Nossa porta aqui a gente tem uma porta de 35 a 40 milímetros, vamos usar o menor aqui que é suficiente para nós, a gente vai encaixar o Aqui ó, onde na maçaneta a molinha para dentro que a gente encaixa para poder colocar na parte central. Se observarmos aqui também a haste do cilindro, vamos ter que cortar ela também no ponto correto. Mas como saber que é o ponto correto? Aqui ó, a tranqueta interna, aquela parte interna, ela tem um local para a gente introduzir essa haste. Só que para isso a gente vai ter que cortar ela do tamanho ideal. Então é interessante deixar para cortar sempre quando terminar a instalação, porque para não correr o risco de cortar antes e perder o cilindro. Né? Aí você perde o cilindro. Então tem que instala e depois você corta no tamanho ideal, de acordo com a espessura da sua porta. No nosso caso aqui, vamos cortar aqui, ó. Isso é suficiente. Deixa eu pegar o alicate. Pegamos o alicate de corte. Cortamos aqui, ó. Deixa eu ver. Dá pra ver aqui. A imagem ficou um pouquinho ruim. Vamos ver. Aí. Conseguimos focar melhor na imagem. Fizemos o corte, ó. Deixamos passando um, um dentinho pra fora, tá vendo? E agora vamos fazer a conexão. Mantemos na horizontal. Errei. 
mantemos na vertical, ó. É e essa troca de horizontal e vertical. Deixamos sempre na vertical, ó. Lingueta recolhida, na vertical. Vamos... Pode olhar que a tranquetinha também tá na vertical, pezinho. E é o local também de acordo. Vamos fazer a conexão aqui agora. Vou pegar o cabo branco. Vamos fazer a conexão. Conectamos aqui. O cabo da fechadura. Ele também vamos e agora a conexão da nossa haste do cilindro da nossa tranqueta. Cuidado para os fios não ficar mastigado a gente vamos se certificar que está que está devidamente encaixado a parte traseira removemos a tampa traseira para fixar eu tinha colocado as pilhas aqui Vou remover as pilhas aqui que eu tinha colocado para você vai observar que tem os dois locais para fixar em cima e embaixo. Temos que observar os dois furos aqui onde vai o parafuso não está obstruído pelo fio para não correr o risco de cortarmos o fio com o parafuso você vamos ver está livre como o nosso kit de parafuso que vem e vem eles mandam quatro parafusos também, corretamente os quatro parafusos para colocar prendendo a parte de trás Aqui. Tá. Tá Fixamos os dois de baixo, vamos fixar os, os dois superiores. Vamos ver agora se o nosso funcionamento mecânico está correto. Essa tranquetinha tem que girar bem leve, não pode estar pesada nem pegando, tem que estar bem leve, suave. Olha, sem dificuldade nenhuma. Muito leve o giro da tranqueta. A lingueta aciona sem nenhuma dificuldade. A nossa maçaneta, ela vem com esse botão aqui, você pode deixar ele para fora, aí se você acionar ela não puxa, você tem que pressionar o botão e acionar, aí ela puxa o trinco, 
aqui a parte externa da maçaneta tá ok e agora a parte importante no começo do vídeo eu falei dos dois botões dos dois parafusos que tem no cubo da fechadura que a gente tem, tem sempre que deixar ele do lado de dentro de casa se tiver do lado de fora na fechadura a gente remove um por vez e coloca do lado de dentro eu falei no início do, do vídeo é a função antipânico por exemplo você está modo fechado você simplesmente vem aqui pressiona e aciona ela já puxa a linguiça mostra novamente a função de pânico serve para isso puxa a linguiça e ela sempre tem que estar aqui desse lado e o botão você pode com a chave Philips também deixar ele pressionado deixar ele sempre aqui ó. você vai observar tem o um furo tem um parafuso Philips você coloca a chave pressiona o botão e aperta o parafuso o botão vai ficar preso, você não tem que pressionar ele sempre. Então sempre que a ponta estiver encostada, você aciona e já vai puxar o brinco. Ou se estiver trancada, você puxa e já vai estar tá liberado. Funcionamento mecânico está ok. Vamos ver agora o nosso funcionamento pela chave, né? Falta a gente testar também a chave. Essa é a chave que vem na fechadura. Você abaixa aqui a. Então vamos testar o, o fechamento e trancamento pela chave, né? Vamos lá. Perfeito. Fechando. Retira a chave. Abrindo. Dá a minha voltinha pra frente de novo. Retira a chave. Sempre você, quando tranca, gira, dá volta ou gira pra trás na mesma posição que você inseriu a chave e retira. Pra, tranca, pra abrir, destrancar, você tem gira pra trás. Trancou, volta a posição, introduziu a chave e retira. Perfeito. Então, está perfeito o funcionamento mecânico. O antipânico funcionando corretamente. Do lado certo, né? É isso aí. Agora vamos na parte de configuração. Eletrônica Vamos agora Fazer a configuração Da fechadura Vamos introduzir as pilhas Você pode observar, ela está em inglês. Ela está em inglês e agora a gente vai fazer o primeiro acesso. Para isso, vamos ter que cadastrar uma senha mestre na fechadura. É, ela vem sem senha mestre e quando a gente faz o primeiro acesso, a gente vai introduzir, criar a senha mestre da fechadura. Pôr a mão no teclado. Ela está mandando a gente inserir o código mestre. Pressionar quadrado. E depois confirmar novamente o código. Vamos lá, vamos pôr 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Jogo da velha. E aí a gente repete novamente o código.
completado. Como podemos observar no início do vídeo, é, quando a gente vai fazer o primeiro acesso, ela está com o idioma em inglês. Então, cadastramos a senha mestre, colocamos, a gente coloca de 1 a 6, a senha que você escolher, no nosso caso colocamos de 1 a 6, e pressiona o jogo da velha, né, que é o quadrado, e repete a senha novamente e confirma novamente com o jogo da velha. Ela vai mostrar a senha mestre que foi cadastrada. E agora a gente vai... Vamos estar tá mudando o idioma. Vamos estar tá mudando, mudando o idioma dela para português. Para ficar mais fácil de entender os procedimentos seguintes. Vamos lá? Põe a mão no teclado. Rigor. Digita a senha mestre. Que foi cadastrada. E pressiona... Vamos, como o tempo expirou, vamos digitar sem a mestre novamente e pressionar o botão I, que é o botão de programação. Não. O botão de programação aqui é o, no caso é o R, ó. R é o botão de programação. Então vamos a gente vai digitar sem a mestre e pressionar o botão R de programação que é um botão preto aqui que tem acima do botão de trancamento automático vamos lá mais uma vez tem a mestre botão R agora vamos escolher a opção vamos escolher a opção número 6 pressionar quadrado que é o jogo da velha Vamos escolher a opção 2, que é línguas, ó. opções de língua. Vamos voltar novamente, vamos fazer tudo de novo só para não ter erro. Senha mestre, botão R, opção número 6. Jogo da velha, opção 2, jogo da velha, e agora você escolhe o idioma que você quer. Primeiro idioma, inglês é o que já está, espanhol é o 2, português é o 3, e francês é o 4. Então vamos escolher a opção número 3. Português, confirma com o jogo da velha. Mudamos o idioma, vamos finalizar no R. Pronto. Agora a gente pode ouvir todas as opções do menu. Vamos acessar o menu novamente. Senha mestre. Botão R Senha mestre